You know, brethren, there is a subject that uh, almost any message, whether it's a sermon ad or a sermon or a split sermon, uh, will be touched on in that message in some way. And that subject is faith. Many aspects of that subject. And sometimes it's dealt with uh, in it, you know, kind of indirectly. Other times it's dealt with uh, directly and becomes a central topic. In fact, it is probably the single most spiritual element in a Christian's life, and therefore it makes sense that it would be discussed as much as it is. But why? You know, there are indications of importance of faith. Scriptures certainly indicate uh, the importance of faith. Paul explained that as a matter of faith, it is that the matter of faith, rather, is in fact the direct responsibility of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 12, uh, 2, just breaking into the verse, talked about looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Galatians 2, verse 16, again breaking into the verse, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. You know, it's uh, further explained uh, the importance in two companion verses. One Romans 14, verse 23, again talking about whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And its companion verse being 1 John 3, 4, where it says that sin is the transgression of the law, identifying then what sin is. But how does faith work? You know, in Hebrews 11, we see the examples of a number of people that are mentioned there. People who are, in fact, our spiritual ancestors. You know, faith can kind of be a, an abstract in some ways. We see in Hebrews 11, starting in verse 1, Hebrews 11, verse 1, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I like um, the way that that verse is rendered in the New Living Translation a little better. It seems to uh, give it a little more definition there. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen and it gives us an assurance about things we cannot see. Continuing in Hebrews 11, in verse 2, for by it the elders obtained a good report, and through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which were not are not seen and were not made by things which do appear. When we drill down just a little bit in Hebrews 11 verse 6 it reads but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he rewards them that diligently seek him so in that verse belief is introduced as kind of an aspect or an element of faith. But Paul explained further, going to Romans 4 verse 3, said that uh, for what does the scripture say? There Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Continuing in verse 5, just breaking into the verse, but to him who believes his faith is accounted for righteousness. You know, brethren, I kind of get the impression when we read through these verses that faith actually begins with belief. 
There is a incident that occurred in Luke 17 where Christ was walking down the streets of Jerusalem and he was, uh, or rather, uh, he was out walking in a crowd. And we see in Luke 17, verse 11, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria in Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go show yourselves to the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, how well did these lepers know Christ? And did he know them at all? Likely not. They probably knew him by reputation. But the important thing is they believed what he said. They followed his instructions, demonstrated their faith by their actions, and they were healed. You know, in contrast, faithlessness has a far different profile. You'll remember the parable about the master of the house who was going on a journey and he left three servants with amounts of money. And he told them, you guys, I want you to take this. I want you to take care of it, do something with it. And when I get back, we'll settle up, see what kind of success you had. Paraphrasing, of course, but words to that effect. And with the first and second circle, they doubled what he gave them to, uh, to use. Very pleased with them, expressed it to them. Then when he turned to servant number three, Matthew 25, Matthew 25 verse four, then he which received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know that you are a hard man, reaping where you do not sow, gathering where you have not strawed. Verse 25, and I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth so that you have yours back now. Here's your talent. Continuing verse 26, his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and slothful servant. In other words, he wasn't at all impressed. Not at all. Brethren, faithlessness breeds fear. And in this example we see the fear in the servant created an incomplete relationship between he and his master. The servant did not trust that the master knew what he was doing. And really sadly, and I think that this is maybe one of the serious lessons out of this parable. The servant missed entirely the fact that the master had given the servants an opportunity and indeed a challenge because he believed in them. He didn't hand servant number three a smaller amount than he handed the others just to see it frittered away or lost. He believed in the man that he could operate and make something of that at least to a certain amount. The servant missed that entirely. In addition to that, another element of faithlessness is confusion about the truth. Paul warned about that. Pardon me. I'm... Uh, where he said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, where he said that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. In 
2 Timothy 3, verse 7, it reads, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these who resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning faith. This subject was very real to David. David understood the connection uh, between faith and lack of faith and confusion. And we see that in one verse mentioned in Psalms 71, verse 1. He said to God, In you, O Lord, do I put my trust, and let me never be put to confusion. And then another element that I wanted to touch on when it comes to the matter of faithlessness is willfulness. That element in a human being that constantly attempts to bend the law or to bend a situation to suit his or her purposes. Second Peter chapter 3, let's turn there, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16, has also in his, referring to Peter, Paul, I mean, um, referring, uh, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things and which are some things hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. So, brethren, we see faithlessness has elements of fear, confusion, and willfulness. But faith itself has important elements that we can point to and that we learn from. You know, I saw a couple of interesting articles the other day. Apparently, they have just discovered a, uh, what they are currently saying is the smallest amphibian ever known. It's a little frog that they found in New Guinea. Tiny, tiny little thing. They showed a picture of him. He was sitting on a man's thumb. He was brilliant green and had these bright, brilliant uh, red eyes. And he was sitting on a man's thumb and he only covered about a third of the thumb. Tiny little thing. Said this is the smallest amphibian that uh, they've ever found. I found that interesting. And then two, there was another article about chipmunks. Well, being from this area of the country, we don't have chipmunks. I always kind of thought they were just basically a a rat of some kind, and never gave it any thought. But they're really interesting little guys. They're a animal that uh, will, in fact, hibernate uh, for about three or four months out of the year because, you know, they live in very cold uh, climates. And uh, they have, under normal daily conditions, they have a, the highest heart rate of any mammal uh, known. Their heart rate routinely goes to 350 beats a minute. Now when they hibernate, it drops down to four beats a minute. Incredible. As far as the number of breaths that they take on just a regular routine day when they're out running around the countryside doing whatever they do, they take about 60 plus breaths a minute. But when they're hibernating, it drops below 20 breaths a minute. Interesting little guys. Found those articles fun. Brethren, they have one thing in common. They have to have oxygen to live. All living beings need oxygen. And brethren, when it comes to faith, faith is the oxygen. 
in a Christian's relationship with God and Christ that keeps it alive, keeps it fresh, and keeps it vibrant. Paul said in Romans 5, Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Another element of faith, and this was mentioned by Mr. Dick, Faith promotes innocence in you and I. Faith promotes innocence in the Christian. Looking at Mark, Mark 10, starting at verse 13, describes an episode where parents were bringing their children to Christ to bless them. Verse 13, and they brought their young children to him and that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those uh, that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said to them, Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. In verse 13, verily I say to you, whosoever who shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. Now, brethren, what is being discussed there? The way that it appears. It is not an issue of where you've got a young person that has to give deference to an older adult. It is instead that pristine, innocent characteristic of a child who looks at an adult, typically a parent. And while I may not use these terms, they look at the adult thinking to themselves, these people know what they're doing. I can trust them. That's the innocence that is promoted by God's, by God in us through faith. And then one final item I wanted to mention is that faith gives us perspective and acceptance, the ability to accept. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there is no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able to bear, but with it and with the temptation will also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, the temptation discussed there is not necessarily a type of temptation that is limited to uh, to a time when one is being tempted by a specific a circumstance necessarily into breaking God's law or, or just uh, doing something silly like I almost did uh, the other day. My wife Beth found a recipe for Neiman Marcus chocolate chip cookies. And she baked a big tin of them, pulled them out of the oven, set them on the oven, and then she went off to Joanne Fabric, leaving that plate of cookies in the kitchen next to my office. And I stood in front of that stove and I was sorely tempted. That's not the kind of temptation being talked about here. Instead, brethren, it includes a temptation to doubt God. That is what God says he will remove if he needs to. Church members, our lives look very much the same 
as everyone else in this world. A mixture of good and bad, pain, fun, good decisions lead to good outcomes, bad decisions lead to storms. Just by the announcements, we have illnesses that are fairly common to everyone else. We age. I'm a prime example of that one. Our lives, in fact, are very much the same with one important difference. We must learn to navigate our lives and our life issues as Christ would have, given the same circumstance. And that's what makes our life experiences different from those in the world. Brethren, we still haven't answered the question that we started out with. Why is faith important? You know, each and every life event, when viewed through the lens of Christ's example, reflects on our relationship with God the Father in Christ. And the quality of that relationship is being evaluated each day. It's kind of an awesome and scary thought, but it's being evaluated each day in this life. Peter, 1 Peter rather, 4 verse 17, just breaking into the verse, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And that's talking about you and I today, our daily lives. Our life events, lead directly to a future in the kingdom of God. Malachi 3, verse 3, explains that he, of course God, shall set as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, brethren, we're going to stop here and change direction because we want to answer why faith is so important. Brethren, turn with me, if you will, to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of many thunderings saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it is granted to be arrayed in the fine clean and bright linen that is righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Some recent events triggered some thoughts on this subject. I want to share them with you. To do that, I'm going to reveal some stuff about Beth and I. We're just about, we're in our fourth year of marriage right now. And both of us, when we're married, married later. You know, we were grown adults. And brethren, when we got married, we brought into our marriage vastly, and I mean put that in capital letters, vastly different backgrounds. For example, Beth grew up in a large family, six of them, four children, mother and dad. I grew up, my mother and dad were there, and there was me, and then I have an older sister, and I think psychologists uh, deem me as an only child given the age difference between us. So. No, it was just pretty much me 
spoiled, I suppose. That's what some people say. But it wasn't a large family or any of the activities that large families participate in. It just wasn't. Um, best family was sports-minded, athletic. I get the impression from the uh, items that Beth has told me and just listening to family uh, reminiscences that uh, uh, almost every weekend they were someplace playing ball, softball or hardball, or her father was officiating. It was always something uh, like that. For me, I'm not athletic. Don't pretend to be, have no interest in sports. The only interest I have is if the Cowboys are winning, I'm a fan, otherwise it's a waste of time. <laughs> Just is. Uh, Beth more or less grew up in the church. She came in when, or the, their family came in to the church and when, uh, you know, she was just an adolescent. Uh, so she had all of that and all that background. And uh, me, I came in the church when I was 20, or in my 20s. And uh, uh, so it was all brand new to me. Um, Beth, as when she was younger, got married, subsequently divorced, and fortunately had to raise uh, three children on her own. Did a tremendous job. Similar, I was married, divorced. We didn't have any children. And in fact, children have just never been part of my life. They just haven't. It's just something uh, not against them, but I've just never been around them. As far as careers, Beth had a career in administrative area of a Fortune 500 company headquartered here in Dallas. Things she's described to me, they were very team oriented, where they're just uh, decisions were made in groups and that type of thing. I work in a profession uh, where the individual works alone. Uh, nobody has responsibility for the work I do, and I don't have responsibility for anybody else's work. What I do, I have to be responsible for. The point I'm making here, brethren, is that we were grown adults and brought into a marriage a lifetime of vastly different experiences, opinions, points of view, likes, and dislikes into that marriage. Those things didn't end with the marriage ceremony. They just simply were brought in together. And those differences have, over the almost four years, it's led to a lot of pleasant surprises, a lot of laughter. There have been some tense times too. Been times when the voices raised. There's been time spent talking over things and trying to work through them. Now, brethren, I'm not standing up here playing true confessions. This is important where I'm going with this. Because I want you to think about that marriage supper and who is going to join Christ at that supper. And to do that, look around this room. Not many people here, but think about the feast when you're in a room filled with people. Think about the people in the church that you know, and you know their backgrounds, you know their histories, you know their lives as Christians, as just human beings, the good, the bad, all of it, and think about that. God's people are seasoned members with years of life experiences, with their own points of view, likes, dislikes, and yes, personal opinions. Now you may be asking, I think I might be if I were listening to me, you may be asking, so, What's he saying? 
What, what's he mean? Because at the return of Christ, all that changes. We're all going to be in lockstep. We're going to agree with whatever God and Christ want us to do. I mean, yes, sir, is going to be the first thing out of our mouths. So what does this have to do with faith? Brother, I'd like to point to a couple of examples of individuals who didn't always agree with God. Turn with me, if you would, to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, verse 12, of course, is talking about Lucifer. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Skipping to verse 14, you were the anointed cherub covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones and you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. As a created being, Lucifer was perfect in the created parts of that being. But, and very likely, it is true, however, that God didn't create Lucifer's personality, nor did he create his intellect. That simply was a function of his created being. And But those were the things that would have given him control over his free moral agency. Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, verse 13, for you have said, he's talking to, about Lucifer, you've said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God and I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be the most high. Brother, something changed for Lucifer. We don't have details. But something changed to where he felt comfortable disagreeing openly and vehemently with God. Now let's compare that to Christ. We look at the events leading up to the crucifixion. In fact, just probably a couple of hours before the very serious events took place. These things were gaining momentum. And the impact of what he was facing finally hit him. We see in Matthew 26, Matthew 26, verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little ways, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then with that prayer, he got up went back to his friends. Then the reality started hitting him again. And once again, we see in verse 32, 42 rather, again, a second time, he went away and prayed, oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Brethren, Christ was saying to God, hey, do we, do we have a plan B? Can we take another approach? I'd like to do this differently. But if it's not possible, okay.
Brethren, when we compare and contrast these two individuals, we see vastly different outcomes. Something happened that Lucifer could not agree with in some plan or something in distant history. And much to his chagrin, God probably just continued on with whatever the plan was. We don't know what, what happened. We'll find out sometime, perhaps. But whatever it was, it affected Lucifer's faith and the loss of his belief that God knew what he was doing destabilized Lucifer to the point he devolved into Satan. An enemy, an enemy of God. Not somebody who just disagrees, but an enemy that fights and fought against God himself. Christ, however, was running up against something that he had really wondered can we change this plan? The difference, though, he never lost faith that the Father knew what he was doing, and as a result, Christ remained spiritually stable. He was confident in the outcome, and he was willingly submissive. Now, brother, when you look through the Bible, you see the biographies of a number of people, and you come away with the suggestion, at least in your thoughts, that it's okay to have opinions. It's okay to have points of view, and even disagree with an approach. And we see that in the examples of Abraham, Jonah, Job, Paul. But all that must be stabilized with the faith that God knows what he's doing and we can submit to his will in confidence and safety. Brethren, the lesson that I think that we can take away is that begin with to the extent that fear, confusion, willfulness dominate any part of our lives. It's emblematic of a lack of belief that God knows what he's doing, he's loving, forward thinking, and that faith in God is actually leading somewhere important. Faith is like oxygen. It sustains one's ongoing relationship with God in the knowledge that that relationship is strong, enduring, and consistent regardless of the circumstances in which you find yourself. So brethren, have we answered our question? Why does faith get so much attention? The answer is really quite straightforward. Faith is a spiritual, a type of spiritual DNA. The faith we develop as human beings will be an element in our relationship with God the Father long after this human experience ends because faith is eternal. 